talked about uh, polarized neutrons. And really what we were talking about was uh, using polarized neutrons in scattering experiments to find out information about the sample. And we, we talked about the fact that you could discriminate between nu uh, nuclear scattering and magnetic scattering and various sources of nuclear scattering, including coherent, isotopic uh, incoherent, and nuclear spin incoherent. And um, today we're going to talk about something entirely different. We're going to talk about using the neutron spin instead of as a, as a tool to get information about the sample using it really as a design element of part of a spectrometer. Uh, and, and the technique that I'll talk about uh, uh, for the rest of this lecture will be neutron spin echo. So let's uh, go back to basics here. Uh, if you were doing a neutron scattering experiment, uh, what you would need, and let's see if I can make the, the, the uh, would be a source of neutrons, so maybe a reactor over here or a spallation source. You'd have neutrons with some wave vector incident on your sample, which would be, uh, and, you, and you'd have to specify that wave vector. So you might do that either by time of flight or by uh, monochromating the neutron beam. And to specify its direction, you would use either slits or collimators. Um, you'd, uh, you'd need, of course, your interesting sample that you've just grabbed off the shelf. Uh, you'd need a method to determine what the wave vector was of the scattered neutrons. Uh, and again, that might be uh, some sort of time of flight method, or it might be using a, a Bragg uh, scattering uh, anal analyzer crystal. And then, of course, you'd need uh, to be able to detect the neutrons. So that's a sort of generic uh, neutron scattering experiment. And as you remember, you would have then the wave vector transfer, which we call Q, to the sample is just the wave incident wave vector minus the scattered wave vector. The energy transfer to the sample, uh, which we often write as h bar times a, a frequency, is just given by the difference in energy between the incident and the scattered beam. And the, the, re the real point I want to make with this view graph is that in traditional neutron scattering, uh, what we generally do is to uh, measure the neutron scattering as a function of the energy transfer and, as, and of the wave vector Q. And we specify those things, Q and energy, by specifying both the incident wave vector and the final wave vector. Of course, we might have a multi-detector. So you can imagine that we might um, be measuring many different uh, wave vectors, scattered wave vectors, final wave vectors simultaneously. And we also might have a pulse source. So we might have many different wavelengths uh, incident uh, uh, on the sample at the same time or in the same period of time. Uh, and we might use uh, time of flight to determine what their wavelength and their wave vector was. But basically what we're doing is measuring the scattering cross section as a function of the energy transfer and the wave vector transfer. So now let me uh, take another tack and, and talk a little bit about um, uh, re a resolution. Uh, if you imagine this w uh, scattering triangle here, the nomenclature has changed a bit. Instead of using Ki, I'm using K for the incident wave vector. Instead of using Kf, I'm using K prime. Uh, and, I've, and I've drawn this triangle essentially for elastic scattering. In other words, it looks like this is an isosceles triangle. But uh, when you try to specify this wave vector uh, in an experiment, you've got to specify its direction by putting some slits in, for example, or putting a solar collimator in. And you've got to specify its length, in other words, the wavelength of the neutrons you're using, by using uh, a monochromator. And in, and in fact, you can never do that uh, uh, completely uh, accurately. In other words, there isn't a single neutron wave vector that's incident on your sample. There's a whole range of wave vectors, which if you, can, if you, you want to think about it, lie inside this little par parallel pipette that, that I've drawn at the end of this uh, uh, k vector here. Same thing's true of the scattered wave vector. The, the final neutron uh, wave vector states lie inside this little box here. And essentially, uh, any neutron that, let's say, somewhere over here in this box can be scattered to some other place in this box, in this uh, final box. And that, and that uh, neutron you're going to see, because it was incident 
uh, on the sample and it's scattered uh, 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 into the detector at this end. So basically you're not seeing only one va wave vector, of course, you're seeing a multitude of wave vectors. And by the same token, you're not seeing only one energy, you're seeing many energies. Now it doesn't take uh, much imagination to realize that the total signal you will see will depend upon how many neutrons you have incident on, on the sample, which will be the phase space density of incident neutrons times the volume of this box, uh, and on the same thing at the back end, that is to say uh, the volume of this box and what the probability is of scattering uh, into various parts of this box. So you can see that if I make these boxes smaller and smaller, then there will be less and less neutrons inside the box. And same on the back end, uh, there's less and less uh, places for a neutron to scatter. Uh, so the intensity will go down if I make these boxes smaller. Uh, on the other hand, the definition of the Q vector will get better because there'll be less uncertainty in the length between this box and this box. And the same with the energy. So there's, uh, so uh, what we have is a, an issue that always affects us in neutron scattering, and that is the better the resolution, the smaller the resolution volume, and the lower the count rate. It's the same in, uh, for x-rays, by the way. It's just that for x-rays, generally these boxes are a lot smaller <coughs> than they are, or at least in, the, in, the, um, uh, in this direction, they're a lot smaller. Uh, than they are for, for neutrons. Um, and so the Q vector is, is, is much better defined. It's, it's not true in this direction, of course, because uh, generally um, the, 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 the degree of monochromatization is not as good for x rays. However, so, so the point I want to make here is that, that, that we have a problem. If we want to improve the resolution of a neutron scattering experiment, what it's going to do is, is cost us intensity. And the whole point of the spin echo technique is, in fact, to break this inverse relationship between the intensity and the resolution. So traditionally, as I said on the first view graph, what one does is one defines both the incident and the scattered wave vectors in order to define the energy transfer and the wave vector transfer accurately. So you define both, both wave vectors uh, simultaneously. You use collimators, monochromators, and choppers to define both of these uh, uh, these incident wave, both the incident and the final wave vectors. Um, now, what different from that? If you do this, if you use neutron spin echo, what what you uh, attempt to do is to measure the the scattering as the function of the difference between appropriate components of these wave vectors. So if you want to, for example, have very good energy resolution, then you only care about, because the energy is proportional to the wave vector squared, you only care about the modulus of these two wave vectors. In other words, the difference in velocity, if you like, of the neutron uh, before it hits the sample and after, uh, after it leaves the sample. So you don't care about each one of these separately. You only care about the difference because we know that the scattering uh, depends upon the energy transfer and not on the individual uh, in, uh, uh, incident energy and scattered energies of the neutron. And what we do in neutron spin echo is we use the neutron polari spin polarization, or the spin of the neutron and the polarization of the beam to encode the difference between uh, various components of Ki and Kf. And in this case, where we care about energy resolution, as you'll see in a couple of view graphs, we use the technique in order to encode the difference between the magnitudes of these two wave vectors. In other words, the velocity change that occurs during the scattering. What you'll see in a, in a minute is that uh, because of the way neutron spin echo works, the, the, uh, you can maintain uh, quite very good resolution, in fact, uh, of this difference quantity here uh, at the same time as you don't define either of these particularly well. In other words, you can use poor monochromatization of the incident beam uh, and of the scattered beam and relatively large beam divergence 
uh, and still maintain very good uh, resolution in the in the in the parameter that you want to to measure. For example, energy change. And of course, coming back to the view graph that I had before, if you have uh, if you have um, relatively poor monochromatization and poor collimation, then what will happen is you'll have rather good uh, signal intensity. So the, the underlying physics of the neutron spin echo technique is Lamort precession of the neutron spin in a magnetic field. And we talked about that uh, a bit last time uh, in a different context when we were talking about uh, guiding the neutron or flipping the spin of the neutron. And I showed you this, uh, this equation here, which governs the uh, rate of change of the neutron spin when it's uh, in, a, in a magnetic field. Um, and what we said was that if the, if the field is constant, uh, then what happens is that the neutron spin precesses around the field direction, like this, and that the frequency of precession is this so-called Lamont precession frequency, which is proportional to the magnetic field applied to the neutron uh, with this constant here. And this constant has this value that you see. Um, uh, the gyromagnetic ratio has this constant the value that you see here. So given this, if we put uh, the neutron in, in, a, in a magnetic field, the total precession angle, which we're going to denote by phi, uh, depends essentially on the time that the neutron spends in the field. So if the neutron spends a time t in the field, then the total precession angle is just the Lamour precession frequency times that time. To give you a, a, a sense of what that means, if you have a very low field, the sort of field that you would have as a guide field, perhaps, uh, of 10 Gauss, and you have a four angstrom neutron, which those are the neutrons which go at about 1,000 meters per second, then uh, in one meter of distance of travel of those neutrons, the, 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 the neutron spin will have pre precessed 29 to 30 times around the field. So if you have a kilogauss field, then it'll be uh, 100 times this, 3,000 precessions. And you'll see why, in a minute, the number of precessions matters. And effectively, uh, the, the reason for it is the more precessions you have, the more accurately you can encode uh, the difference between two components of the neutron wave vector. Um, so uh, let, let's just let me just say that uh, again, uh, in terms of a magnetic field here, the 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 the, the phase that the neutron accumulates is just the Lamour precession uh, frequency times the time the neutron spends in the field, and that time, of course, is the distance divided by the velocity. So, in, so in, in a very, in a, what you can think of this as is that the phase of the, uh, of the precession, how many turns the, the spin has gone through, is a measure of the velocity of the neutron. If I have a constant magnetic field applied over some distance uh, like this, then uh, the, the uh, precession angle is going to be inversely proportional to the neutron speed, uh, as we see here. So the, the, the principle of neutron spin echo is extremely simple. Basically, what you're going to do is you're going to rotate uh, uh, the, 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 the classical spin. We'll talk about what it looks like quantum mechanically in a minute. But let's think about it in terms of the classical, uh, uh, of a classical, think of the spin as a classical vector for the moment. And what we're going to do is to think of the spin first rotating anticlockwise and then rotating clockwise by the same amount. And of course, it'll come back to uh, the same orientation. Now, in principle, in order to do this, we will need to re reverse the, the direction of the applied field because the, the sense of rotation of the, of the spin around the field depends upon the sign of the magnetic field because of this uh, equation that I have back here. So if I reverse the magnetic uh, uh, field, then the spin goes around in the opposite direction. So this whole business of echoing the spin, that is to say having the same number of anti-clockwise turns as clockwise turns, is of course independent of the speed because uh, the, the, it just depends upon the, 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 the field integral 
B times the distance the neutron travels in the field. It'll whatever the speed of the neutron, it will travel. It will have the same number of anti-clockwise turns as clockwise turns if nothing changes uh, about the neutron speed in between those uh, 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 turns. Now, you'll, as you'll see in a minute, um, this same effect of rotating clockwise and then anti-clockwise, or the other thing, or the other way around. Um, can be a, can be obtained rather than by reversing the direction of the of the applied field, simply by using a pie flipper of the type that we talked about last time to change the orientation of the of the neutron spin, and that's a lot easier to do uh, practically than to change the direction of a magnetic field at some point in space. Now, obviously, if the neutron's velocity is changed by the sample. In other words, let's say the neutron gains energy so it speeds up. Its spin isn't going to come back to the same orientation as it did in this first bullet here because the number of anti-clockwise turns is not going to be the same as the number of clockwise turns. And the difference will be a, a measure of the change in the, in the neutron speed or energy. Uh, and, and now you can see why the magnitude of the, of the B field matters because for a small change in energy, if you have a large field, you'll have a large change in the, in the uh, um, precession angle of the neutron. So here it is in, in, uh, laid out for you. So let's start out on the left-hand side of this figure uh, with neutrons initially polarized out of the plane of the screen. So they're polarized along the z-direction there. The neutrons are traveling in this direction. Uh, and first thing that we're going to do is to apply a pi by two uh, turn. Now, if you look back at the lecture notes from uh, last uh, time, uh, there, it, there is a picture in there of, of how one um, creates a, a pi by two turn. The easiest way to do it is to process the neutron in a field through pi by two. But what you wind up with, uh, in, in that case, if you, if you do a pi by two precession, is a bunch of neutron spins that are perpendicular to the magnetic field. Essentially, I'm going to assume that all through this instrument, there's a vertical magnetic field along the z direction. So what I've done is I've prepared a beam using one of the polarizers that we talked about last time, either a helium-3 polarizer or a super mirror, with all of the spins pointing out of the board. They're lined up with the magnetic field. They're perfectly happy like that, and they're going to propagate through the instrument. And then suddenly, I'm going to apply this, this pi by 2 turn so that all of the neutrons now lie, uh, spins lie down in the plane of the screen. And I've drawn a bunch of different colors here. I think I've drawn three colors, red, blue, and green, to uh, indicate the, uh, the fact that we have different wavelengths of, of, of neutrons here, different velocities, if you like. And now I'm going to send these neutrons into a large magnetic field and the spins are going to process around like this. Now, of course, the fast, the fast neutrons uh, are going to get through this, the field more quickly. And since they get through the field more quickly, they don't experience the field for as long, so they don't turn as far. The slow neutrons, on the other hand, are going to hang around in the field for a long time. Their precession rate is going to be the same, because the precession rate only depends upon the uh, magnetic field B, uh, but since they've hung around for longer than the fast neutrons, they will have processed through a greater angle. Obviously, I've only drawn sort of a part of a turn here, but in fact, of course, the neutrons are spinning around and around and around, and I'm just showing you where they've gotten to at some point. Now I'm going to do a pi rotation of the, of the neutron spins about this axis. And if you look back at the flippers that I showed you, uh, it's obvious that most of them do this. Some of them you might have to think a bit, but it, it, it's fairly clear in the Mezai flipper, for example, that it does exactly this. It processes the neutrons by 180 about uh, some direction. And you can see that what's going to happen is the red neutrons are going to come out here, and the blue neutrons are, are going to come out here. In other words, Whereas it, at this point in time, or this point in the instrument, the slow neutrons were ahead in phase. Now after this pi flipper, the neutrons are behind in phase. 
and the fast neutrons are, are in front in phase. Remember, they're still going around in this same direction because the direction of the magnetic field hasn't changed. Now, if I, have, if I apply the same magnetic field on this side of the instrument as I applied on this side, of, on the front end, then the spins are all going to come back to the same phase because they've got to go through the same, the same angle to get caught up, uh, and, uh, all because of this pi flip in the middle here. Now what I'm going to do is apply another uh, pi by 2, which brings all of the spins out of the plane of the blackboard, uh, of the screen, and, and then I'm going to uh, have a polarization analyzer here to analyze what the polarization of the beam is at this point. And uh, what, what, you, what you can see is that uh, the final polarization is just going to be the cosine of the difference between the, the, uh, the, the phase angle, precession angle in the incident beam minus that in the final beam. Why is that? Because Imagine that one of these neutrons hadn't precessed as far. It would be uh, have its uh, a vector out here somewhere. Now imagine that you're going to rotate it by uh, pi by 2 to see uh, what its z component is. And clearly its z component is going to be this the z component here is going to be the same as the x component here. And that x component is just equal to the, cos the, uh, the cosine of the, of the precession angle. So what we've got now is that the pol final polarization of the beam will be the average over the beam of this um, uh, uh, difference between the precession angles before and after scattering. So now I'm going to try and uh, show you an animation that, that um, demonstrates that. Uh, so here's the case where you have just one a neutron spin. And you can see that in the top diagram, the field is the magnetic field is to the right, and in the bottom one, it's into the plane of the blackboard. And the neutron spin is precessing. When it comes out of the field, it doesn't precess anymore. And now this is the case where I've changed the direction of the field, which is equivalent, as I told you, to having a uh, um, a pie flipper in there. And of course, you can see that if I haven't changed the uh, the velocity of the neutron, it comes back to the same position. So once more, maybe the easiest one to look at is the one at the bottom here, uh, where the neutron spin is precessing around the field. Uh, when it gets to the end of the field, it's at some angle that we don't know. Uh, and then it doesn't change until it gets to the other field, and then it unwinds itself and uh, comes back to the, um, to the, uh, to its uh, um, old position. So now let's see. Uh, I can do it with multiple neutrons. Let me just show you how that works. So now what I'm going to plot, uh, you're going to see plotted is the polarization of the beam, neutron beam, is a function of distance. So the neutron beam is going to come in along here, or ne neutrons are going to come in from the left again. And uh, what you'll see is that there'll be neutrons with different velocities that all start out at the same point here. But because they're different velocities, they will, they will separate as they go through this. And, and you'll see what happens. So as the neutrons go into the field, they're processing at the same rate, because the, field, the, the rate only depends upon the field. But they'll go through different angles, because they'll spend more or less time in the field. Uh, but in the, in the oppositely directed field, as they go through, you'll see they'll all come out in the same direction. Now what you should pay attention to in the next time I run this is what the polarization of the beam is at different points along here. So as we're going along here, what you'll see is because at some point here, the, the spins are in all sorts of directions because the uh, velocities are different. Uh, and so if you take an average over all of the neutrons at this point here, average over all of their spin directions, you'll find that the polarization is essentially zero. So the polarization may start out as 1, and it will oscillate and eventually go to 0. Uh, and you'll see what happens if you just follow that, uh, follow that view graph. See, polarization oscillates, and then she goes to 0 at the end of the magnetic field, let's say. And then nothing changes until it goes into the next magnetic field. And then it all comes back. So in a sense, the polarization in the middle of this whole thing is a bad measure of anything, because 
Uh, what, you've, uh, what you've really got, of course, is a depolarized beam, but each neutron spin has done something quite deterministic and predictable. It's only when you add them up that you get zero, uh, and uh, so you think you have an unpolarized beam. That's a lesson, by the way. Uh, an unpolarized beam, if you measure it, um, will have zero polarization. That does not necessarily mean that uh, all of the, spin, the spins are in random positions and that you couldn't get them back again if you tried. Um, so, all right, so now we've, we've seen how that works with, 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 um, um, uh, with uh, uh, some animations. And now I want to s show you what happens now if the, if the energy changes. So it's probably easiest to do this on the blackboard. Uh, so what we have, what we're going to have, uh, is is that the difference between the 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 phases, the Lamour precession phases, in the incident and the scattered beam, are just going to be given by this constant gamma times b times the distance the neutrons travel uh, into one over v1 minus one over v2. And of course, I can expand. Uh, V2, so I can write that as gamma BD, 1 over V, and I'll make the, this one 1 over V plus delta V. Right? Uh, so if I now work that out, what I'm going to find if you just do that expansion is that this is just going to be gamma BD times delta V over V squared. Uh, so I'm going to have now uh, let, so this is the difference in the Larmor phases. Hopefully you can see the board there. Uh, but the energy change in the scattering, which is, is usually denoted as h bar omega, is just uh, half the mass of the neutron times uh, its initial velocity, which I dropped the one here for, for convenience, minus the, velo the velocity of the scattered neutron, uh, like this, uh, and that's just going to be uh, m v, uh, excuse me, delta v. So now uh, I can write those uh, um, write those things down. I can use the fact that m v is equal to uh, h bar uh, k, which is equal to h bar times two pi over lambda, uh, to simplify some of these things. And if I do that, what I find is that phi 1 minus phi 2 uh, comes out to be uh, just gamma b d mass of the neutron squared wavelength cubed, that's an important effect there, times the, um, the um, omega over 2 pi times uh, h squared, I think, not h bar squared. I think that's right. What we're going to do, so let me rub it out, let me erase it and do it again. So um, what we're going to do here is we're going to take, uh, we're going to take, we're going to use this equation here. Let me try to get out of the way. Phi 1 minus phi 2. And we're going to substitute for uh, delta V. So that's going to be gamma B D over V squared. And then delta V from this thing here from this, this equation here, is just going to be h bar omega over, uh, 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 excuse me, t m times v. And then we're going to use the, the v, this, this equation here for v. And eventually, when you, when you just uh, do all the cancellations, that comes out to be gamma b m squared lambda cubed times omega over 2 pi h squared if I didn't mess it up. So now realization that we're going to measure is an, a is, a is an average over all of these neutrons. So the phi 1 uh, and phi 2 apply uh, are, are quantities that uh, apply to the, the individual neutron spins. Uh, and I'm going to have worked out what the precession angles are for the individual neutron spins. And then I'm going to have to average over all of the neutron spins in order to, to get the polarization that I measure. So in this uh, equation uh, here, if you like, 
uh, I'm still talking about uh, the, the individual phases uh, of, or the phases of individual neutrons as they go through the system, uh, as, in, as sort of indicated by the fact that I've got a specific V1 and a specific V2, uh, and, uh, and I've written the difference between these in terms of just the delta V. So I could have, in my experiment, I could have a range of values of V1, uh, as, as you'll see down here in a second, uh, and this equation would be valid for any one of them. Did that answer? We're writing this down for particular neutrons. A neutron which comes in with velocity V1 and is scattered with velocity V2. And you'll see in a second that when we average those to get the beam polarization, we will average over, over all of these things. But for the moment, we're just thinking about a neutron which comes in with velocity V1 and goes out with velocity V2 so that its change in velocity is this, uh, and with that change in velocity, there is a change in, the, in this um, uh, difference between the Larmor phases, which is proportional to, to, to delta V, and is, and, and is therefore also proportional to the uh, h-bar omega. So the statement is that now that the difference in the in the Lamour precession angles for a particular neutron, this is a particular neutron that processes in the, whose spin processes in the incident uh, uh, magnetic field minus the precession angle of the same neutron as it processes in the uh, final magnetic field. That quantity is proportional to the omega, which is the the frequency change, uh, or you know, h bar omega is the energy change, if you like, of, of the neutron during scattering. Now what we've got to do is we've got to, we've got to figure out what the total polarization is. So how do we figure out what the total polarization is? Well, this is the, 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 the contribution uh, to the polarization of this one neutron that I just talked about. Um, uh, but that one, uh, the one neutron um, that, that I, so this, a, a neutron could be scattered with various different uh, changes in energy according to the usual scattering law, right? This is the usual scattering law that you saw in earlier lectures, S, S of Q and omega. So that's the probability essentially, or pro is proportional to the probability that a neutron will be scattered with some uh, energy H bar change h bar omega. So we have to multiply that by this phase, cosine of this phase angle. And then we have to integrate over all of the different velocities that this incident neutron could have had. And uh, we, since the velocity is inversely proportional to the neutron wavelength, we can write that simply as the intensity of, in the incident beam of a particular wavelength, and then integrate over that. So this thing here, the phi 1 and phi 2, depend on wavelength and depend upon omega. And so what, what we'll have is these terms here multiplied by the cosine phi 1 minus phi 2 for an individual neutron and then integrated. And the simplest way to, to think about the, the normalization is that it has to be 1. The result of this thing has to be 1. If, if there's no change, if phi 1 is equal to phi 2, so the, the, the normalization is just this top bit here with phi 1 set to phi 2. Did that, uh, Colin, can I ask um, the, the people who asked the question whether that now made sense to them? Are we, are we, seeing, any, are we seeing any vacant expressions that um, mean that I should go through it again? Maybe some vacant expressions, but nothing we can do about those at this point. <laughs> I think everything's fine. All right. Okay. So let's uh, let's keep going then. So hopefully, what I, I what I've told what I've managed to persuade you is that that if you measure the polarization at the end of a spin echo experiment, uh, you measure this quantity. Um, so uh, what is this quantity? Well, if you uh, if you um, uh, 
for the moment, ignore this uh, uh, lambda piece here, uh, um, and and just simply uh, because it's because it's inconvenient. Uh, what what we have here is a cosine, essentially a cosine Fourier transform of s and s of q and omega, and uh, the the constant that goes in there. Remember that this this difference in the phase was proportional to uh, omega. And what I'm going to do is write this whole constant here, this whole mass here before the omega, as something called tau. Uh, and so what I'll get is just uh, cosine omega tau integrated over omega times s of q and omega. And that is equal to something called the, the intermediate uh, scattering function, uh, which, is just, which is defined as the Fourier transform of, uh, of, of s of q. And the time at which I'm measuring that uh, uh, intermediate scattering function is called the spin echo time and is this, just this bunch of constants that I had uh, uh, on the previous view graph. And to, and to put them into perspective, if you work out this constant, so if you imagine a field of, of one tesla meter, so that's uh, uh, 10 kilogauss over one meter, that's uh, not too hard to do with a, with, a, with a solenoid with a lot of current through it and a lot of turns. And you imagine an, a four angstrom wavelength neutron, so that's 0.4 nanometers wavelength, then this tau turns out to be about 12 nanoseconds. And if you, because of this, this uh, wavelength cubed thing here, if you increase the wavelength of the neutrons from 0.4 nanometers to 1 nanometer, you very rapidly increase the time uh, at which you're probing the system. So uh, this, this, this uh, tau constant, this spin echo time, goes from 12 to 186 nanoseconds. So essentially, what you're probing with, with this type of spin echo, which, is, which, is, which we've um, uh, assumed that the only thing that phi depends upon is the velocity of the neutron, uh, is measuring the so-called intermediate scattering function which is either the time Fourier transform of S of Q and omega, or if you like, it's the Q Fourier transform of the, the two-particle correlation function, which is just defined as the probability that if you have a, a, a scattering center at the origin at time zero, then you will have another scattering center at position R at time t. So. So here's what I just said, uh, and this is the important thing to remember, that spin echo probes the sample dynamics as a function of time rather than a function of frequency. Uh, so now uh, let's uh, think a bit about um, why, uh, what, 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 what you'd see if you thought about this in terms of, of quantum mechanics rather than in terms of classical spin vectors. So. Uh, remember, at the beginning of this uh, spin echo instrument, we have a pi by 2 flipper. And what the pi by 2 flipper does is that uh, it produces a, a neutron state, which is an eigenstate of some uh, operator like Sx, because that's the direction of the field. Uh, and if you work out what the eigenvector of Sx is, it's a linear supposition of up and down. So it's just the, the, the up um, uh, eigenstate plus the down eigenstate. Now, these two eigenstates are eigenstates, of course, of the SZ operator. Uh, and uh, once you put them into a, a magnetic field, they have different Zeeman energies because one of them corresponds to a, a the up corresponds to a, a, let's say, to a spin which is parallel to the, to the magnetic field. And so the magnetic moment of the neutron is, uh, is anti-parallel to the magnetic field. And the, and the energy will just be minus mu naught b is the, is the Zeeman energy. So the, the Zeeman energies of, the, of these little magnetic moments, or spins if you want to call them that, in a magnetic field will be different for the up and down uh, uh, neutrons. And because, the, uh, um, because the, uh, the neutron has a constant energy, if, it, if its potential energy changes, so, that, so does its uh, kinetic energy to maintain the same constant energy. So if these states have different potential energies, they'll also have different uh, uh, 
kinetic energies and hence different velocities. Uh, in other words, if you like, the magnetic field is birefringent for polarized neutrons because that's exactly what we mean by birefringence is that, that states with different polarizations have different velocities. So let me see if I can do this, uh, uh, show you what that looks like in a, in a quantum mechanical picture. Now what, now what we have is we have a little wave packet over here on the left and these lines across it are supposed to represent the, the, the uh, wave fronts, if you like, of, of, a, of a particular velocity, a particular wavelength neutron. And so what's going to happen is this little wave packet is going to propagate uh, through, through this, thing, through this um, uh, system here. And let's see what happens. So uh, what you see is that the two spin states, the red and the yellow, separate. And they arrive at the, at the sample at different times. And then they come back into this other field. Uh, and by the end of the field, they overlap. So what's happened there? So uh, let's do it again. Uh, the, the two spin states traveling with different velocities arrive at the sample at different times. They interact with the sample at different times. And then they, and that information about what they, they found out about the sample at different times is, in co is, is then brought back into an interference pattern between the two spin states. And uh, so if I, that, what I showed you there was a, was a low resolution version. If I do a high resolution version, what you'll see is the, the chain, the magnetic field is larger. The magnetic field is larger, so the birefringence is larger. So the time difference between the two spin states uh, interacting with the sample is larger than it was in the case of the low resolution case. And so uh, they report it, re the neutron spin states essentially report back on what the state of the sample was at uh, uh, a time interval which is greater than it was in the low resolution case. Uh, so let's see. Okay, so uh, you know it's, it's sort of useful to be able to switch backwards and forwards between those pictures because sometimes one is more useful than the other. But I will tell you a little anecdote and that is that uh, uh, the, the uh, this technique, neutron spin echo, was invented by, by uh, Ferry Mezai back in the uh, uh, early 70s. And uh, Ferry had been asked in, uh, by his boss in Hungary, Ferry originally, as I, uh, I think I remember, was a theoretical nuclear physicist. And he'd been asked by his boss to think about what they could do with polarized neutrons. And he thought about it for a year and went through a lot of, uh, of uh, uh, quantum mechanical equations and finally realized that he could think about it in terms of uh, this classical vector because it, because it is a, a two-state quantum system. And so it can be mapped exactly onto uh, a, 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 a classical vector equation. And once he, once, once he had that picture in his mind, the, the, the spin echo thing became, became fairly obvious to him. It's very hard to see if you do it in, in quantum mechanical terms. However, there are cases, and we'll see those next time, where it's actually easier to think in terms of the quantum mechanics. So this is uh, the first uh, uh, spin echo spectrometer that was built. Uh, it's called Ion 11. It was designed, uh, uh, Fermi first uh, built a kind of breadboard version at the ILL, which had very low resolution, and then built this thing called Ion 11. And the guy who really made it work uh, is, was John Hayter, uh, who uh, uh, spent an awful lot of his, his time uh, building this thing. So there are some things to note here. The, new, the, the reactor is, is way over on this side of the view graph. And the neutrons are coming down this, uh, this neutron guide here uh, uh, to, the, to the instrument and uh, are deflected out into uh, a polarizer. Uh, it turned out that in order to make that polarizer work, uh, uh, Meza had to, uh, had to develop super mirrors. Super mirrors had been thought of by the Russians, uh, and there's a, there's a paper by Turchin, I believe, if I remember that correctly, that describes how you would make a super mirror. But unfortunately, the Russians at that time did not have available uh, in, in the neutron labs flat enough glass uh, to be able to, to deposit these, these uh, multi-layer mirrors. 
and, and uh, Ferry was the first to do those. I think I remember it was Iron Silver. Uh, so there's a stack of super mirrors in here. Uh, there's a, a um, pi by two flipper here. And then there's a long solenoid. It's a, a, a multi-layer uh, solenoid uh, that uh, extends from here to here. Uh, then there's a, a, a region in which the, the uh, sample sits. It sits in one of these orange cryostats. And if you can just see, there's, a, there's some um, uh, Helmholtz coil here, which is applying enough field to the sample to maintain the neutron spin. And then there's a, an, a, a, another, uh, and then there's a pie flipper in here that I can't even see myself. And then finally, uh, a, well, not finally, then a long solenoid with a high current through it, which is the second big magnetic field. And then hidden behind here, no, hidden in here somewhere. Yes, I think this is the, this is it here, is the pi by two turn, followed by another super mirror polarization analyzer, and then a neutron detector. And so uh, the, uh, the 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 magnetic field that is doing this the precession is generated by a solenoid. It's a water cooled solenoid, and then the whole thing. So this front part is is fixed, and then the back end here is on air pads down here. So that this whole uh, scattered uh, direction here can swing round like this so that you can change the scattering angle of the, of the whole thing. So that's, a, that's what a, a spin echo uh, spectrometer looks like. What you'll see if you look extremely closely at some of these, I'm not even sure you can see it, is that wrapped around the outside of this so uh, solenoid are a few turns of wire. So each of these solenoids has the same number of turns, and uh, it has, and, and the current that is the powers them goes through both of them. So, by definition, since they're in series, the, the the current going through this one is equal to the current going through that one. So, in principle, the the, the, the number of precessions in in the front end is the same as the number of precessions in the back end. But because of those few extra turns that I mentioned, you can change the the, the field in, let's say, the second one uh, by, by some small amount. And if you do that and you measure the neutron polarization, what you see is this oscillation in polarization. Uh, and the highest point here is the echo point. Now, if, the, if, the, uh, if there were only a single wavelength of neutron in here, in, in this instrument, you wouldn't have this envelope here. You can see there's an envelope here. Which is the, the 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 peak of the of the um, of the uh, uh, oscillating polarization is 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 governed by this envelope, and the reason for that is that you've got this uh, uh, I of lambda term in here, the intensity of different uh, wavelengths, and there's only one wavelength, uh, only one field at which all of them echo, uh, all of the different wavelengths. Uh, and so, and if you if you step off in field, then uh, you you don't echo for uh, completely echo for all different wavelengths. So you see that the amplitude of the signal is maximized at the so-called echo point, and then it decays on either side. And that and that decay is is a result of this, this distribution of wavelengths in the in the in the incident beam. Now. Uh, Mesai chose uh, uh, to use um, the uh, solenoid because it's, uh, it, it's, it, it has a very uniform field. But nevertheless, uh, and you need a uniform field because if you if you have a different field, if you have different if different neutrons going through the instrument see different fields, then of course the whole echo thing is spoiled. And so everything we've talked about up to now assumes that you can make a apply a field to the to let's say to the incident neutron beam and to the final neutron beam that is the same for all neutrons. Now imagine that this uh, rectangular green thing here is is the solenoid seen from the side. Well, it turns out that there is a particular field integral if you go down the axis of this thing, and there's a different field integral if you go down. Uh, uh, the solenoid parallel to the axis, but off the axis. In fact, the field of the, the change in field scales as the 
the square of the distance away from the central axis. Uh, so uh, this is a problem because it means that if you, even if you have a perfectly parallel beam of neutrons, the spin echo length for a neutron that goes down this path will be different from the spin echo length for a neutron that goes down this path because the B fields they uh, 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 see are different. So what uh, Mezai did was to recognize that in this geometry, uh, if you um, stick something in the beam here, let's say, whose current density varies as the square of the distance from the center, then by Ampere's law, if you go around this, this total uh, circuit here, then the amount of current contained between these two is proportional to the square of the distance uh, away from the center. And so you can, you can set it up in such a way that, that uh, this correction element, called a Fresnel coil, because the current density is, is proportional to the distance squared from the center, uh, excuse me, um, is, uh, cancels out this effect of the inhomogeneity of the field. So constant uh, spin echo uh, time, you need to apply this uh, need to coils uh, in order to cancel out the aberrations uh, due to the fact that uh, basically due to the fact that Maxwell's equation, uh, one of Maxwell's equation is that div B is equal to naught, so a finite solenoid always has end effects associated with it. Um, these days, incidentally, people don't make these things anymore. They make uh, two um, uh, linear ones crossed, and that's, uh, that works also for this type of thing. So uh, uh, just to show you what uh, Spin Echo did when it was first introduced, this is a, this is a diagram that was first uh, produced, uh, as far as I know, by Sonny Sinha at the time of the Brinkman Committee, which is a long time ago now, uh, which was to try to see uh, where um, neutron scattering contributed in terms of the energy transfer uh, from in scattering at the sample and the wave vector transfer. Uh, and you can see that uh, before this yellow region here is a region of Q omega space that um, was accessible before uh, spin echo and then uh, spin echo added this uh, piece, this dotted line piece down here and has in fact extended this now uh, several more orders of magnitude down in energy uh, from, uh, let's see, no, this is, milli, this is millivolts. So this is probably right. This is nano-electron nano volts. So we're probably down to, to somewhere down here. And that's the equivalent uh, energy resolution uh, um, did, deduced from inverting the, the time resolution. Uh, so let me just give you a quick example of, of something which uh, Spinecho has enabled. Uh, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on, on these uh, because uh, uh, um, the, you know, different groups in different places have different um, uh, concentrations as far as science is concerned. We have a question, actually. Okay. Um, someone asks, do we ever have to worry about phase wrapping, or does that just put a limit on the resolution? Ah, that's a really good question. Do we ever have to worry about phase wrapping? So you don't have to worry about um, uh, phase wrapping because this is a Fourier transform. I mean, so, so in a sense, I mean, you always have in Fourier transforms the, the whole phase of this uh, cosine uh, function here, right? And because it goes through many oscillations. So, the, so, the, so, so, so in a sense, uh, you don't have to worry about phase wrapping in spin echo because you don't have to worry about it in, uh, when you do Fourier transforms. It's all, it's part of uh, the way the Fourier transforms work. Does does that is that a satisfactory answer, or do we need to do we need to go into that more? Do we? we uh, come to my example here, which is uh, polymer reptation. Uh, so, what is polymer reptation? Here's here's a uh, um, you know tangled mess of spaghetti. Uh, 
uh, or polymer chains, depending on how you like to think about it. Uh, and here are some uh, uh, white chains, and here's the, this red chain that we're going to concentrate on. And we, the question we're going to ask is, how does this <coughs> red chain move when it's, going, when it's surrounded by all these white chains? And um, at short times, we sort of know what the answer is. And, and the answer is something called Rouse dynamics. And the typical time scale for that type of dynamics scales as the wave vector transfer to the fourth power, or uh, equivalently to 1 over the distance scale uh, to the fourth power. So let's do an experiment in which uh, you have uh, mostly deuterated chains. So all of these white chains are deuterated. And the reason we do that is we don't want a lot of in, uh, nuclear spin incoherent scattering. Because as we t talked about last time, nuclear spin incoherent scattering flips two-thirds of the nucleus of the, of the neutron spins and doesn't flip uh, one-third of them. So if you had all uh, incoherent scattering, you'd reduce your signal by a factor of three. Two-thirds flipped, one-third not flipped, the difference is a third. So basically, because hydrogen is a very strong nuclear spinning coherent scatterer, we don't want it. So we put a, a basically a deuterated matrix, so these other chains, other than the ones we're thinking about, are deuterated. And then we have uh, about 10%, which are the ones that are going to we're interested in, which are going to be uh, uh, regular hydrogenated. And then what we might imagine, and this is you know what Dijen thought would happen, is that at, at, at longer times, the, the, the chain would start to feel the tube uh, that is created, and you can see it, the sort of artist's rendition of that tube um, uh, formed by the other polymer chains, and that the only way it could move would be along that tube, and it would, it would move by the sort of movement that a snake has, uh, which is why the whole thing was called reptation. So here's, here's some uh, data. Uh, it's called, it's just S of Q and T, it's plotted as a polarization. Uh, so the polar, it's a spin echo polarization, goes from zero up to one. Uh, and uh, the time along here is just the spin echo time that we talked about. And this thing has gone out to 35 nanoseconds. So if you rescale this stuff, and you rescale it as Q squared square root of T, you can see that all of the, if, if everything were Rouse dynamics, then all of these, all of these thing, all of these curves, which are taken at different values of Q, ought to lie on top of each other. And what you can see is that they do lie on top of each other, except that they all break away, and, and they break away at, at different times depending upon what the uh, Q vector is. So for Q, this green stuff here is apparently 0.97 nanometers to the minus one, and there at that Q the dynamics breaks away from the Rouse law, which is down here, uh, onto, this, onto this other curve. Uh, and that was taken as, uh, as evidence of uh, this uh, type of uh, dynamics called uh, reptation, which Pierre-Gilles de Jeanne had, had proposed earlier. So uh, I'm now going to switch topics for the last uh, quarter of an hour here. So this would be a good time if anybody else in at any of the other uh, places has questions to ask questions about this, what I would call the standard spin echo, and then we'll move on to this uh, thing called resonance spin echo, uh, which is uh, uh, uh. regarding the beautiful interference pattern uh, which you observe when you scan the field in this uh, tweaking uh, coil, and um, so. Uh, I wonder if you could just, for emphasis, explain why we need to see that interference pattern, because it would appear that we could just basically set up these two coils without the tweaking coil, and then simply measure the polarization of the beam uh, using our polarizer, and then that would be it. So why do we need to scan this tweaking coil? Uh, that's Okay, good question. So um, basically, basically, we have, uh, let's go back to the picture here. Basically, I, 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 I skipped over rather quickly the fact that there is a field around the sample here. It's just a guide field. It has, you know, there's a turn, couple of turns of wire here, and another couple of turns of, of wire 
above, uh, and then there's a and then there's a pie flipper. But um, in fact, what you to, in order to get perfect symmetry, which is what you were Colin was suggesting, you'd need to have the pie flipper right in the middle between these two uh, large fields. And, and in fact, what is right in the middle is the is the sample, not the pie flipper. So the pie flipper is is by by you know because you can't have two things in the same place at once, has to be offset from the from the center point. And so by definition, you're not going to have exactly the same number of turns on the back end after the pie flipper as you are on the front end. And so what you're going to have to do is to use what what we call a phase coil which is these uh, few turns of wire around the solenoid to, to, to shift the phase of the neutron until you, can, until you can get this interference pattern and figure out which is the echo point. Uh, I should say that these days when they do that, uh, they, know, uh, they, they don't measure this whole echo curve. They measure actually four points, uh, four or three, I can't even remember. Uh, and and the, the instrument is stable enough that with uh, one, two, three, four points. They can fit the curve and know exactly where the what the what the amplitude of the echo is, because you've basically got the amplitude, the period, and the phase, uh, and the period you know because you know the field, uh, and uh, the the phase is what you're adjusting to get uh, 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 to to get the amplitude, and it's the amplitude that you care about, and it's the amplitude is effectively what is plotted. In this in this diagram here. Okay. Did that answer the question, Colin? Uh, yes, it did. Thank you very much. Okay. Other questions from uh, Indiana or UCSD before we embark on neutron resonance spin echo. Okay. So um, the the uh, the neutron spin echo we've talked about up until now. You can imagine that the new, each neutron is carrying a clock with it. And the clock is just like a stopwatch, the, and, the, and the spin is, you can imagine, being the second hand on the, on the stopwatch. So each neutron has a, has, a, has a stopwatch, which is going around at the same rate, and the, uh, the, the, sort of the angle of the, of, the, of the hand is essentially the face. Uh, now, uh, that, that, that's one way of doing it. Uh, there's another um, um, way that, that was, in, was invented, uh, which, which has, instead of the neutron carrying the clock with it, it visits clocks. And uh, I'm going to show you how that works. So uh, to, to set it up, let me imagine that I have uh, an, a coil. And, and to be concrete, this coil is something, uh, let's say, which is uh, five centimeters long. The, the neutron beam is going to come through it from, let's say, the left. And it's a coil which is wound uh, like this uh, so that it produces a field in the vertical direction. It's a solenoid, if you like, that's producing a field in a vertical direction. And now uh, I'm also going to have another coil which is going to be wrapped a different way on this thing, uh, which is going to produce uh, an RF field. And the RF field which is, of course, a linear field going backwards and forwards, uh, 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 which I can imagine as, which I can represent by two counter-rotating fields. And uh, as we'll see in a minute, only one of the rotating ones matters. Um, so, so effectively, in that situation, what I've got is I've got a constant field and a rotating field. Now, um, Remember what I told you before was that, that in this, in this uh, constant field here, the neutron would process. And so uh, I can, I, I can um, start thinking about this whole thing uh, in, in a rotating frame. And I can go into a rotating frame, which is rotating with the Lamour precession frequency of this B0 field. And so in that frame, the neutron doesn't see. The neutron basically only sees this field. So if the field, if the neutron is aligned with this field to start with, right, this little B1 field, uh, the B1 field is going around at the Lamour precession frequency, and so is the spin. So the 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 neutron doesn't see in that rotating field in that rotating frame of reference. The neutron doesn't see any change in the field. 
the spin is lined up with B1, B1's going round, the spin's going round, in the rotating frame they're both stationary. Okay, so now uh, supposing uh, I think about what would happen if I brought a neutron spin into this coil. So I've got this coil and I'm bringing in a neutron spin that is in some direction uh, in the plane perpendicular to this B0 field. Then uh, when, it, when, it, uh, when, it, when it comes in, let's say it's pointing down here. Okay. Now uh, I'm going to climb into the rotating frame and, uh, uh, and in the rotating frame this spin is going around at the same rate of the, as this uh, B1 vector. Uh, and so I'm going to assume that, and then, and then I'm going to set up the, the, the strength of this B1 field so that as the neutron goes through this coil, it's going to execute a pi, a pi turn. So it's going to execute a pi turn around this field and it's going to go over to this dotted line. So in the rotating frame, uh, it's going to come in in this relationship with the, with the B1 field. And at the end of the, uh, of, the, um, of, the, uh, of, the, of the coil, it's going to go through the coil, it's going to come out like this. But in that amount of time that it took the neutron to go through that coil, the B1 field went around this far. And so if I want to know what the phase of the, the, of the neutron is in the, in the lab frame, I have to add this angle, B1 entry minus B1 exit, onto this dotted thing here and get the uh, exit position of the neutron. And so what you, what you see is that the uh, phase, uh, the difference in phase um, uh, between the, uh, uh, between the uh, entry and exit has, this, uh, has something to do with the, uh, the phase that it came in and also picks up a term which has to do with, uh, with the velocity. Um, so now, if you go through this, uh, imagine that you have a set of these coils. So here's the first coil. Here's an, uh, here are four separate coils. And in between them, they have zero field. Now, this is hard to do, make zero field, but you can do it if you work hard enough at it. And so what you have is you have a neutron spin that's coming in uh, from this direction. It suddenly goes into this coil where it sees a B0 field and this rotating B1 field. And it does what uh, I told you it did uh, before. Uh, uh, and then the same in each one of these. So now if you, if you go through this and you say, well, OK, um, what's the, supposing it, it enters this A coil uh, uh, at, at some time um, uh, TA, then the phase of the field, so this rotating field, is just rotating with a more precession frequency. And supposing we've chosen the origin of time in such a way that this is the field, this is, excuse me, is the phase of the, of the RF field in this coil. The phase of the neutron spin, I can take whatever I like, so let me call it zero for the moment. Now let me go on to, now let me go through this thing to the, uh, to the other side and look at the time at which the neutron gets to this point. Clearly, that's the time at which it entered, plus the amount of time it took to cross this coil. Uh, then the phase of the field is just given by omega times this time. Uh, and the phase of the neutron spin is given by this equation that I had uh, down here for calculating the phase of the neutron spin uh, at the exit of this coil. And, it, and you can work out the others for yourself as you go through and figure out what the what the, what the phases are. And what you will find is that if you set this up um, um, that was in this way that this distance between these coils and the distance between these two coils uh, and, the, and the, um, um, the thickness of the coils is like this, then you will get echo if there's no uh, change in the velocity of the neutron at this point. Echo means that you get back the polarization of the beam that you started out with. Now, the neutron's not carrying the clock this time. In other words, in this region here, the neutron spin doesn't process at all. 
It only processes in this in this uh, RF field here, and the amount that it processes in and, and these these RF fields are synchronized, so that they are the clock, if you like. And what happens is that the neutron gets to the next clock with a different phase, and so it's affected differently uh, uh, as it, depending upon what its what its phase was when it got here, and that phase is going to depend upon its velocity. So uh, I'm going to show you now an animation. Whoops, oh, that didn't work. Let me see. Okay, so here's an animation of that. Hopefully, um, so here's a here I have uh, some coils. Uh, these are these things are called bootstrap coils because they actually have two coils. Don't worry about that. It's a detail. And so here's my first coil, second coil, third coil, fourth coil. Here's my sample. Uh, my neutrons are going to come in uh, like this, and they're going to be uh, scattered from the sample down this thing, and then uh, uh, analyzed down here. So let me start this up. And what you'll see is that um, these we're going to have three different uh, neutrons here with different wavelengths. Yellow and almost invisible going to have one wavelength, blue and red. That means they'll have different velocities. And, you'll, and what, you, what I want you to look at is what happens to their spins as they as they reach these coils, so we're gonna, we'll run this a couple of times, and you'll see you see that they uh, the, their spins are differently affected by the coils, but when they all come out at the other end, they're all in the same orientation. So let me do that again. That red one concentrated on the red one, it changes its spin, changes its spin again, but it comes out pointing upwards. So this is the echo condition where all of the spins come out in the, in the direction they went in in, even though each neutron with a different wavelength has gone through uh, a different, um, um, processed by a different amount in each one of the coils that I've sent it through. So one more time just to, to see that. You see that the different neutrons have different precession angles in the coils, but when they're all done, uh, they're, they're, they come out at the same angle because you've got echo, and the echo condition is such that just these distances are the same, and the frequencies of the clocks are the same. Uh, in other words, the, the RF frequencies are the same. Uh, so that... Can you emphasize why we need the long zero field region? Ah, okay, thank you. Um, can we emphasize? Let me go back to this. Okay, the long, what, you, what you don't want is you don't want the neutron spin to process between, between visiting these clocks. So what happens in each one of these RF coils is that the neutron spin processes by an amount which depends upon its velocity. And so the angle, which it, uh, the angle of the neutron spin when it comes out of here is a measure of the velocity that it had going in and of the and of its and of its incident uh, spin direction. So let's go back to the animation again. Uh, so let's follow let's follow one of the spins. Let's follow the red spin. A little bit, little bit, back. Did you see what happened to it? Now, if uh, if it had been processing in this region. Each one of these neutrons uh, spins would have processed, processed in this region by a different amount, and so they 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 wouldn't have had the same orientation when they left this coil as when they got to this coil, and it's important that they they do have because what's happening between this point and this point, the neutron going from here to here, is just that this clock is advancing, and so this clock is ticking along, and now. Uh, it would have gotten to a, a certain number of ticks, if you like, when, when this uh, uh, spin, neutron spin gets here. And, and I'm now going to try to figure out uh, what, what, what that, what, what, its, um, uh, what, uh, what its speed was as it came through here. And, and that's going to uh, depend upon where the, where the uh, clock has gotten to, uh, because let me see. Let me go back here. See if I can show you. Let me go back a couple of view graphs here. You see, if the if the spin is in some position when it goes in, and the 
the rotating B field has gotten further because the neutron was going slow, more slowly, then what's going to happen is that this B field is going to be around here. And then I'm going to rotate, do a pi flip around it, this whole thing that I did down here. So it's important uh, that the neutron spin not change between the in direction between the, the, the clock coils, if you like. Uh, otherwise, the whole thing gets spoiled. Did that answer the question? Through the argument with this stuff again, what you'll find is that polarization is basically the same as you, uh, 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 as you uh, be given by the same sort of expression as you had with regular spin echo, except now there's a different expression for this uh, so-called neutron resonance spin echo time. It still scales as the cube of lambda, uh, and many of the constants are, are the same. But in fact, there's, a, there's an extra factor of two in here. Um, uh, and if you have these so-called bootstrap coils, which are two coils next to each other, uh, you actually get an extra factor of uh, four here. We got so in the follow-up, he says, I guess better resolution is obtained along with the zero field region. That's correct, better resolution. And you can see that here. The, the, the zero field region has this length, uh, this di length here, L. D is just the, the, the distance through the, the, the coil. So you can see, in fact, that the, the, the time, uh, the spin echo time, is essentially directly proportional to this distance here. So yes, you're exactly right. The longer the, the zero field region, the larger the spin echo length. Um, OK, so this, this just says what I've been trying to emphasize all along, that, we, that with this RF method, you have fixed clocks, uh, and in the in the, in the other method, you have uh, the neutron carries the clocks. Uh, so that's um, what, what, what I'm going to say today. Uh, maybe let me just say that the, each one of these two methods of doing spin echo has, has its own advantages and disadvantages. One of the uh, advantages of, of, of uh, uh, this, this uh, neutron resonance spin echo method, as you'll see uh, later, is that it's quite easy to tilt these coils and, and not have them perpendicular to the, to, the, to the beam. And that turns out to be something useful. Uh, it's also true that you can um, sort of uh, it, use, use different magnetic fields here on the sample uh, by turning off the precessions here and turning them back on here. So there are various advantages and disadvantages of these, of these two things. So you shouldn't, you shouldn't get too hung up on this factor of four, in fact. So that, I, I'm going to quit there unless there are further questions. So Colin, do we have further questions from? Uh, 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 I think you uh, had a very nice introduction to Spinecker. Uh, People will go and look at this uh, and, and try to get through it. It seems like some sort of magic, actually, but it, it does seem to work, I guess. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> yeah, it does seem a bit like magic, I agree. <clears throat> I, I, I keep trying to uh, persuade myself that it's really a simple version of quantum computing. But anyway, that's, a, that's an aside. OK, so if there are no more, no more questions, uh, thank you for your um, uh, participation today. And I will see you on Thursday. Yeah, thank you.